Good afternoon. I'm so glad to be here and to be able to give some explanation after telling the pineapple story so many times, and most of you having heard it, uh, I want to give some explanation. Every time I hear it on the video, I get convicted myself. <laughs> I, uh, because rights and surrendering rights is a day-by-day -day thing, as you well know. We can take it back so easy. Uh, I was uh, in West Virginia, and I was invited to speak in a church there, and uh, we lived there, and we had just blackened our driveway, so I had put a couple of garbage cans there with a ladder over top so nobody would drive in my driveway and mess up the new uh, blacktop there. And somebody stole my ladder. <laughs> and I was angry, and I fussed over them stealing my ladder. And f then I thought, hey, I've got to, I had to tell the pineapple story that night. And I thought, oh, God, I can't do it. I prayed, I, I can't do it. I, I'm not fit to do it, but you know, God seems to have a way of saying, hey, I'll forgive you, just go and do it anyway. And then when the blessing of that meeting, as so many people got right with God, uh, it, got, it humbled me so, you know. It's sometimes when we aren't really right with the Lord and he uses us anyway, that really humbles you. Well, uh, I, was, I came down for breakfast one day and my four children and wife had already gathered uh, around the breakfast table. And one of my children, one of my boys, had the nerve to sit on my chair. And you, did, you don't do that in my house. That was Dad's chair. And I plainly and quickly told that boy, get out of my chair. And, and then I tried to have devotions with him. I should have just skipped devotions that morning. <laughs> it just didn't go over. Anyway, uh, they went off to school, and I tried to pray that and I went to my office, tried to pray, and all God seemed to say, hey, you're, you know, talking about rights, and you're fighting for your chair. And I said, all right, God, and got right with him. But then I had to face my son. That night, I, we got around the supper table, and I looked at the boy that had done that terrible deed, and I said, <laughs> son, you know that uh, I go all over the United States telling the pineapple story and, and uh, rights, and I fussed, you, fussed with you about my chair. When I said, yeah, you go preaching, he says, yeah, Dad, and we're sick of it, you know. <laughs> uh, one time he said, Dad, if you ever don't feel good, I'll tell it for you, I know it. <laughs> uh, and so I said, son, will you forgive me? I give up my right to sit on that. You can sit there. As a matter of fact, all oh, any of you, any of you can sit. I don't have any more right to sit on this chair than anybody else. And, and I give up that right. And I, so please forgive me. And, and so that was it. Now, the next morning, they had all came quickly to the breakfast table, beat me to it. It's all the times it's hard to get them all in time. And they, they got there, and one, the other son was sitting on my chair. And they were all kind of smirking, grinning, and I just found the empty chair and let in prayer, and we started breakfast. And over the next couple of weeks, my daughters even sat on my chair. Now, they're good girls, they, and uh, they even sat on my chair. And uh, you won't believe this, but my ordinary wife one morning <laughs> sat on my chair. And that's when, that's the way she is. That's, that's why we lasted long on the mission field among the headhunters there, because she's so easygoing, laid back. But, uh, and then finally, there was the, my chair was empty after the fun wore off. In other words, they helped me, you know, surrender my rights. Now, we're not supposed to help our loved ones surrender our rights. I mean, that's something God's got to do in us. But anyway, they helped God out a little bit. And, uh, after that, they left my chair free, and I said, hey, I, I, I really meant it. I really did. I noticed that, and I appreciate you insisting I sit here, but uh, you can sit here. And they said, no, Dan, uh, really, it's your chair. We know it's your chair, and we want you to sit there. Now, when we surrender our rights, then God gives us back or can do for us. Now they insist I sit there. Well, my son turned 16. I was away on meetings, and uh, he had gotten his license, and my wife had taken him to the place to get his license. He came, I came home, and he said, Dad, I got my license. I thought, oh, no. <laughs> I mean, this boy's bigger. He's tough. I mean, he's been, always been sitting in the back seat and saying, hey, Dad, let's get this buggy moving, you know, and just, <laughs> just itching for the 
day when he showed us how to drive. Um, and uh, we had this old car, it was an old ship, 10, 12 years old, and it was on its last leg. I thought if anybody ever, you know, tramps down on this thing, it will blow up. And so we were babying it along, mom and, um, his mom and I. And uh, he, so after uh, a couple of nights, he said, Dad, I want to go and see my friends. Can I borrow the car? I got my license. And I gave him this lecture. Now, son, be careful. That's all we got. It was a good money raiser at missionary meetings. I mean, I, 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 I drove that car and, you know, left it running. Uh, and I, I sometimes wish I still had it. I really do. Uh, but uh, I said... Son, go easy and just like a father, you know, go easy, don't drive it hard and remember the thing's ready to blow up. That's all we got and all that kind of stuff. And he, well, I shouldn't have gone to the front window and picked out the window when he left. I shouldn't have done that. I couldn't believe it. That thing peeled rubber <laughs> out the driveway and up the street. And I thought, oh, no, here goes my car. You know what I did? I quickly ran upstairs, got to my office, got on my knees and said, God, I want to give you my car. <laughs> I... I uh, friends, I, I couldn't keep it much longer. Um, I, I knew it was gone. And so, hey, don't wait to give up your rights till you have no choice. I, I'm, I'm supposed to. See, I'm teaching the pineapple story, but here I wait again till I have no choice. And uh, I said, God, the car's probably three, four blocks up the street if it's still running. And uh, I want to give it to you real bad. And... I surrender my right to ever drive it again because I thought I probably wouldn't anyway. And I said, it's yours. You do with it. If you want him to drive it, fine. If you want me to drive it, whatever you want, doesn't matter. And God's car got back that night. It's amazing. God takes good care of his property. And I said to, this, to my son, I said, son, I watched you go. And he kind of grinned. And I said, son, you know what I did after I watched you go? I gave the car to God. He said, what you do that for, Dad? I said, well, I couldn't keep it much longer. I knew I couldn't. And from now on, if you want to drive God, God's car, you're going to have to get on your knees. Ask him. <laughs> I thought, you know. I thought, I've got to get this lad on his knees somehow, you know. And... and <laughs> And so he would, uh, when he wanted to use the car, he would kind of give me a clue. He said, Dad, I'm, uh, it's like after supper, he said, Dad, I'm going up to pray a little bit. And I, <laughs> and, and that was my point of temptation. Now, am I going to say no? In my flesh, that's what I want to say. Hey, you're not getting that car anymore. And, uh, but uh, God, then I had to deal, God dealt with me. You know, it's, is it really mine? Is it still mine? So you have to give it every day. And so I, uh, uh, he'd come down from his room and say, well, God seemed to say yes. Every time God says yes. <laughs> and uh, so I give him the keys, see. And friend, that car kept running and kept running. God, God still does miracles. And uh, you know what he said to me later? He says, Dad, I knew you'd given it to God and mend it because when you gave me the keys, you never said, now, son, be careful, drive it easy. You just gave me the keys. And that meant that he knew that I was through with it. So I'm still, God's still dealing with me on my rights. And, you know, when we give all of our rights to God, when we put everything on the altar, we are controlled by the Holy Spirit, aren't we? We're really spirit-filled or spirit-controlled. Now, when we are spirit-controlled, then Satan gives us attention. And then we have uh, spiritual warfare. If we are living in a carnal state, Satan doesn't give us much problem, but oh, he is after those that live a spirit-filled life. And in the jungle out there in New Guinea, when uh, I had been there about seven, eight years, and I didn't know anything about lordship, I hadn't been to the seminar yet, I hadn't given my pineapples to God, I, hadn't given, I was fussing and fighting over everything. I didn't know anything about the spirit-filled life because that's a direct reaction to the uh, direct sequence to the uh, uh, surrendering our rights. And I didn't know anything about the authority of the believer, the power of Jesus' name. And can you imagine me in this jungle with all these people, animists, spirit worshippers, who had 
invited the demons into their lives. The children now born demon-possessed because sin had just reached that place saturation where it couldn't get worse than it is. And now I'm living there as a missionary with my wife and the children are growing up and I don't know these answers. And that's why I begged God to make my wife sick enough so, so we could go home. I, I, I was running from them. Now, hey, I loved my wife. I don't want her to be sick, but she was praying the same thing. We were in this thing together. And so, uh, just wishing, we, we couldn't get anywhere, see? And that's when God met me. And, you know, I came to the place where, at the end of my rope, where I cried out. I said, God, there's got to be more to it than what I got. And then God gave me a book which talked about the spirit-filled life. And for the first time, I could realize what it was to walk a spirit-filled life and to live, uh, to walk a spirit-filled walk. And then another book gave me the authority of, of the Christian that we, in Jesus' name, have authority. This, is, this authority we have over those ones that would destroy us, over the ones that would uh, harm us. And they were threatening us uh, all the time, and I would run from them. Uh, I, be, I, had a tr I had a quarter mile track measured out, and I would jog to keep in shape. I thought it would save my life. Uh, of course, God was the one taking care of me. And as we saw on the, on the screen a while ago, uh, how Bill presented to us how we must bind, how God binds Satan for us. Well, th this is how often he took care of Satan and kept us or certainly we would have been destroyed in that culture. But then, at other times, friends, we realize that we must resist Satan ourselves. As it says in James 4, 7, resist the devil, and he will flee from you. And 1 Peter 5, 8, uh, that verse that starts, be sober, be vigilant, uh, whom resist steadfast in the faith, and so on. So uh, I came to this place where we were now entering his territory in areas where they couldn't even come to me. Satan so bound him, he'd put a snake in their way, and the chiefs couldn't get through. Sometimes the men got through, said the chief wants us to come and preach. And, uh, and I said, well, tell the chief, um, come here. And they, he'd just have different bird calls or different noises in the jungle, and that's uh, connected with demons, and they couldn't get through. And so finally, uh, he had me go through this jungle to them. And it was on, one man was with me, and we tramped through this swamp. And uh, one thing I want to say, if you ever go through the New Guinea swamps, if you fall off a slippery log, don't grab for anything. It'll bite you. Or, or you'll, get a, you'll get a hand. I mean, you, down the, these jungle walls so thick, you can't see into that jungle. Just fall down into the mud. The leeches are slow, and uh, anything in the mud is slow, and uh, go for the slow ones. Um, <laughs> I, I'm walking on these slippery logs, and this fellow behind me said, your feet are so dumb, we'll never get there. I, he didn't want to go first because we'd be two different parties. So I'm walking first, and us white folk, we can't see right and sense the danger in the jungle. Well, he yelled out, he says, you dumb Tuhan, didn't you, your eyes are going blind. You're, not only your feet are sick, but your, your eyes are bad. He says, didn't you see the snake? And look behind me, this big yellow snake, a snake about, oh, like a big uh, bulk constrictor. Lay across that log, right, his tail was in the swamp, his head was in the swamp. I didn't know which end was which, and I didn't really care to find out. <laughs> I, I looked at that snake, and I was sick inside, because they had always said, Tuan, if you cross Hohoi's snake, or the, uh, the, the, the Swangi, the, the evil spirit snake, if you cross that snake, you, they'll destroy you. They'll scream at you. They'll scare you so bad you won't be able to go on. You'll die. And, and they'd say, come with us sometime. Oh, brother. Uh, I, I would say, hey, the Bible says that he that is in us is stronger than Satan. And that we have authority. And they say, prove it to us, Duan. Come with us. I said, I don't have to prove anything to you. Um, uh, it's the Bible says so. You know? I learned that in theology class. I See, I didn't want to prove anything. Uh, but now I had crossed this snake. Now what would you have done? Hey, this. then you get caught up on your devotion real fast. And you, uh, you start, all of a sudden prayer becomes a priority when you've crossed the snake, right? 
and I thought I'm going to kill him and so I had my stick and I beat that snake and he squirmed I never did see his head or tail but he squirmed finally lay still I said Nimrod he's dead come on let's go and he says ah it's even worse crossing a dead one (laughs) I thought man could he have saved me a lot of sweat (laughs) I didn't know what to do I I was sure praying I said now I remembered what I'd so recently read in the book how that I have authority in Jesus name to resist him and I had prayed that morning as I went that, that he would fill me with his spirit and put everything in his hands. And so uh, I tried to remember what the book had said, how do I resist him and so on, because I'd never done that. And uh, I went on praying. Now then, we were down the trek about, a, about a, another hour. And I'd really forgotten about that whole thing. My heart stopped beating so hard and I'd forgotten about the snake. Then he said, I've got to go to the washroom. I've got to relieve myself. He says, you keep on going. You're so slow. Your feet are so dumb. I'll, I'll catch up with you. And so he had disappears in the jungle on the right. And I went on. And there were these palm trees stand so tall and a complete, complete canopy overhead and uh, dark, smelly jungle. All of a sudden, this screaming from right from my left here, out of that wall of jungle. I didn't see a thing. I didn't, I couldn't see where this terrible screaming came from. It was so loud. It's, it compares best to these horror movies when they're just a blood curdling screaming. Uh, it just scared me so bad. See, the, the wall of jungle is so close to me, and there it was as if it just, And I couldn't see a thing, and I just froze. I'm standing on this log, slowly sinking into the swamp. And I can't lift my knee to get on the next log. And I don't know what to do. My breath was coming coming in gasps. My heart was pounding. I thought, I'll last about 30 seconds, this, and I'm gone. And, you you know, I can't get away from that which is destroying me. And I did what you would have done. I cried out, Lord, help me. And he says, resist him. Right flashed it right in my mind. Resist him, he'll flee from you. Now, friends, I, I wanted to say, God, I'm not of that denominational persuasion. To, we don't do that. <laughs> you see? Uh, some people do, but I, I'm a very conservative Christian, you know. And, uh, and I wanted to say, God, I come from this. You don't argue with God, folks, when you got... 30 seconds, 15 seconds to live, and you're sinking into the swamp, right? And you're going to die. You, you just obey. Hey, there's a place where all of us will obey. And I said, I looked at the no- noise, deafening. And I, that's the loudest I ever prayed, by the way. I thought God would never hear me. I, but hey, but he's in me. Hey, it's good to know he lives right in you. You don't have to shout in prayer. He's right there. And I looked at noise, and I thought, what language? What language does he speak? And I thought, he probably doesn't know Dutch. Dutch, not many people know Dutch anyway. I thought of Aoyu, the tribal tongue, but I'm not too good at that. And I thought, I've got to be good at language. Tell him how you resist him. Uh, I did it in Indonesian and English. I said, hoi, demons, evil spirits, wangi, all these. In Jesus' name, I command you, leave me alone. And you know, the book had said, now you've got to quote scripture. And how could I think of the right verse? I, I couldn't, can hardly get it in front of you. I, I, uh, I said, greater is he that is in me. That's the verse came to, God helps us out. Friends, God helps his children when they're in trouble. And he Just in my mind, greater, and I shouted, I have authority because greater is he that is in me than he that is in the world. Shouted that at the noise. Stopped right there. Just total quietness in that jungle. My My heart was still pounding, but I pulled myself out of that mud and got on the next log. As a matter of fact, when this was happening, I had stuck that stick in the mud and hung on to it and leaned on it. But it was going down too. And you know, I got on the next log and wiped my brow and I said, God, thank you. Thank you. And you know, the peace of God came over me in that jungle. I was always so afraid to go through the jungle. They always, I get so depressed. But when I had to rebuke the powers of Satan, they fled from me. And I saw beauty in that jungle on that trip. It's unbelievable. God gave me a song that I taught my natives on this area of resisting. Satan, we're not listening to you anymore. We're going Jesus' way. We're not going your way. We're going to sit by his fire and so on, which became a tremendous song to them. And I, I saw orchids. I saw beauty. And then Nimrod caught up and he said, 
And I told Nimrod, did you hear the noise? He said, no, I didn't hear a thing. And I described, and he pulled me by the arm. He says, two on for one, don't go on your stubborn way. I'm saving your life. He'll follow parallel to the path, attack you time and time again. There's no way you can live through it. And he says, come home. And I said, no, he fled from me. Come with me. And somehow, that was God to persuading that unsaved man to come on with me. We got to that village. There sat those three st- chiefs in this house. The house four feet off the ground, a vine floor, vine and bamboo floor. It's, uh, and these are native houses, and the spear rack is lower than my head, so we have to sit down and the, the smoky fire. But all here stood these, they sat these chiefs and all their men. So many men came into the house, we were way overloaded. And then the st- vines start to snap, and then the floor is going to come down, you know. And when those vines start to snap, then the chief says, bail out, you know. And so they jump out and try to catch it before too many snap and the thing goes down. That's what you call uh, hanging in there, I guess. And, <laughs> and we, and, and these, now, I sat there and explained the gospel for the first time in this village of Saharin. It was about 900 people there. The three main chiefs were there and many of them men. And they sat spellbound, just quiet, listening intently. These people were Possessed by demons, I couldn't believe why there was no interference like in other churches. Later, I discovered that because I had resisted Satan, rebuked the devil, he had fled from me, and he wasn't back yet. I don't know how long he would stay away. I didn't even realize it until after I was through with that service, after I led 40 men to Christ in that village. I had been on the mission field for seven years and had two converts. Now I had 40 people in one Sunday morning turning, and first there was that chief Sabuo. Oh, he was, he had hepatitis, elephantitis now. He was going to die, but he had skull, he had skulls like bunches of coconuts hanging in his jungle houses, and he had killed so many. He says, can your Jesus make me clean? I said, yes, he can. And they all laughed. There's a no way to a no way, and there was too much commotion, and the vines started to snap and they bailed out and it was out of control there just for a moment but then they came back in it's amazing how much weight you can put on it if you add it slowly and but you can't get them excited um, and now he, I suggest Jesus can forgive you if you will believe on him and receive him and by receiving they had to destroy all the uh, Satan's stuff. And, and then I said, you've got to confess your sin. And he confessed all these murders, you know, 21 of them. I thought it would never end. He knew them all. And he said, can your Jesus? And he prayed. And this old chief, he was the leading headhunter of that whole area, bows his head and prays to Jesus. Because the powers of darkness were bound. They had no authority. They had fled and nothing could keep him from praying. Oh, so many people are bound up, they can't hear the gospel. I think this is coming in America where people can't hear it. They can't understand it. And maybe we've got to use the same thing. And friends, these people, and then two weeks later, I went back there again, and uh, that third chief, all the pressure was on him. His men wanted to be saved now, and the pressure was on him, so he was the first one. And then his men and the other two groups, the other two farms brought their uh, wives and so on. And what a church we started there just overnight. What a weapon of our spiritual warfare. You know, it says the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but mighty through God to the pulling down of strongholds and bringing in, into captivity every thought to the obedience of Christ. And uh, it, notice it doesn't say the weapon. It's the weapons. It's not just prayer. Prayer is a powerful weapon. But resisting is another one, and there are several more. And we must use to, uh, learn to use the weapons of warfare. Now, two weeks later, in the, in the afternoon, in the morning I went back to the Saharin village. In the afternoon I went to Amenda village, and that chief was shrewd. He said, let's build a church, get this missionary preached, then he'll give us special prices, prices in his store, and he'll hire us for jobs and give us free medicine. He's shrewd fellow. So to build a church, but it wasn't big enough. They never had all the people in one, one building before. And they, he blew the trumpet and the horn and everybody came, the women were on this side, men were on this side, it was packed out like sardines, they were just all there, and uh, they, uh, they had built me a little table, and, and the feet of the front row people were under my table, I was almost back to the wall, it was unreal, 
the roof came down to it within about eight feet off the ground, and then they had a little leaf wall. They didn't buy, put proper walls and just leaves, and uh, there was about five feet of desperately needed fresh air space because these people never bathe, and you get 300 of them all together like that. It's unbelievable, and uh, they can never sneak up on you. Uh, you know... And I try to preach. We told them that little song, Jesus, Eugene, and I told them this. Jesus, Eugene, and I, ho, ho, ye, jiba, pro, Jesus, Eugene, and I. It's just a simple little song. And I, I taught them that, and they half-heartedly sung it. Then I led in prayer, and they were all quiet. Because there was something about me talking to this great, clean spirit up there. That, see, they respected worship of spirits. And so they were quiet then, but then when I tried to preach, oh, friends, it was unreal. This big village pig, domestic pig, came crashing through that leaf wall. Now, there was no room for him inside, but he came in anyway. He came in on the women's side, and you should have heard him howl and shriek, and the women jump up, and they've got all their babies and kids. And that pig was, oh, it was unreal. And the men on this side laughing, and the women screaming. And the chief was there, and I said, chief, this isn't going to work. Get that pig out of this church, you know. And he says, hey, men, get him out. Now the men jump up. Now the benches, if some guy jumped up, the other side would tip, you know. And these these wood went flying. It was terrible. But they broke up some of those sticks that they were sitting on and beat this pig. Now finally the pig got into the center aisle. And uh, there was the only place for him. And... um, and the men got around beating this pig. Now the owner starts to holler, even worse. Hey, man, so you have some fighting going on now. But they're beating this pig. I said, let them out. Those dumb guys were all around the pig, wouldn't let them out the door. And so I said, chief, get the door open. Oh, we got the pig out. Now to fit everybody back in there was impossible. I said, some of you stay out. Oh, they were fussing at each other. They're sitting in each other's places, and they could never get them all in again. Anyway, I said, the rest of you stand up, and I got the whole thing quiet. And I wondered where I was in my message, and the pig comes in again. This time the men said, now the women had a chance to laugh at the men. And the whole thing repeated itself over and over again. That pig crashed through this wall. Once he came right up here, right by the post, he came in. I didn't know where to go. I squeezed to that table, leaned over backwards, and he went through there and right through the other side. I don't know, preacher, if you could have preached. Uh, it was wild. Now, not only the pig in the church, but the dogs, uh, hungry dogs. They never kill the dogs. They've got spirits in them. And so these dogs are starving dogs. And they whole packs of them chose that area to do their howling. Like sirens. It was unbelievable, the noise. And so it was impossible. Then all the babies were crying. You couldn't blame them. They were miserable. And uh, they were all yelling and crying. And the women were talking. I can't believe. You don't know how women can talk until you come over there. Uh, it's unreal. And at my home village, I, I told the women, I kicked the women out of church. And we, we built another church building on our own expense, and my wife taught them. But on these other villages, I couldn't do that, and it was unreal. And I tried, and I tried, but friends, this was the first time in the event in the village, but I never got anywhere. They didn't hear a thing. And I quit, and I walked home. I said, God, you've got to help me a little bit. I can't do it all myself. <laughs> and, I mean, I had done my best. And complain at God a little bit. We shouldn't complain at God. And then I said, on the trail home, I said, God, Jesus, if you'd stood in my place, you wouldn't have been so defeated as I was. Of course you wouldn't. And I said, Jesus, would you mind telling me what you would have done in that situation? And it seems like God was anxious to answer that question. Don't you think he's waiting for us to ask some questions sometimes? And he flashed right on, the, on my mind. Didn't you learn anything at the trail two weeks ago? Well, then's when I resisted Satan, but hey, my life was at stake. This morning, I almost got run over by a pig, but uh, my life wasn't at stake. But his ministry, the cause of Christ, was at stake. And I went back to that book where I'd read about how our authority over Satan, how I could resist him. And I had promised the chief I'd come back next Sunday afternoon, and I hated to go back. When you failed once, you hate to fail again. And so on Saturday, I didn't want to resist Satan in front of all those people. What if it wouldn't work, you know? And now I'd only done it once at work, but, you know, it couldn't happen twice now, could it? So on Saturday afternoon, I got right with God, and 
I said, Satan and all your powers of darkness, in Jesus' name, I resist you. Like James 4, 7 said, I, and I command you not to interfere tomorrow afternoon in the Amenda village. I'm going to be there about 4 o'clock. <laughs> and I command you no interference through the pigs or dogs or anything. And I have authority. Now, friends, listen to this. I have authority over you on three areas. One, because of the finished work of Christ, where Satan was defeated. Do you believe that? Satan was defeated at Calvary. All right, secondly, because I'm seated with him in the heavenlies. These are the identification doctrines. Crucified with him, uh, buried with him, risen with him, and seated with him far above all principalities and powers. Quote that. And then thirdly, because greater is he that is in me than he is in the world. Three areas. We only need to use one of these premises. And, and just to remind Satan, you have to listen because I'm telling you this in the name of Jesus. And I have authority. I'm seated with him. And so I did that. And with great expectation, the next day on Sunday afternoon, I walked to the village of Amanda. And the whole crowd was there again in the same building. And there wasn't a seat empty. I mean, they were all packed in there. And there was no noise. They were so quiet. It's unbelievable. Just totally still. And I preached the gospel to those people. And there they stood as I gave an invitation. They grabbed in my hand. I want to take the hand of Jesus. I want to start walking with him. And that's how they illustrated by grabbing my hand. And there they stood a whole row of people. And the first man down the aisle with tears in his eyes, I said, Jeconias, what about you? He says, I don't want to go on living in fear of these demons. If there's a better way, I could hear you say. And what they said, we can hear you now. Well, before others had heard me with their ears, but they couldn't hear me with their understanding. It was a blockage. And we had to, through the power of Jesus' name, break that blockage so people could actually hear. And I believe there's people in America today that aren't hearing. And friends, they came to be saved. And so I said, oh God, can you imagine me walking home that day? I wasn't acting like a conservative Christian. I was just praising God and I thanking him. I'm glad my own home church didn't see me. And I <laughs> thought, how, you know, can you think of my predicament having to share this with my home churches? Um, and then I said, God, would you do it one more time in Hashima? That's it's a big church and that last half can never hear me. There's usually 450 to 500 in that place. And the rafters, you know, they can't make rafters that long. So that it's a deep church, you know, they make, make it long. And I said, God, would you do it one more time? And it seemed like God on that trail rebuked me and seemed to say, you lack faith. You, you ask her one more time. Hey, my name never loses its power. You can use my, ta my name wherever you go, every day of your life. You don't, one more time, aren't we? You know, we say, God, do it one more time. And I said, oh, God, I can't believe this. You mean you can, we can use your name like this and go to every village here? And, and that's what I did. I said, God, that's what I'll do. And I couldn't believe the, the, the authority. And, and you know, friends, the, the strange thing was, I still had such problems in my own heart. I, I was still such a warrior. I hadn't got victory. I was still confessing the same sins over and over again, you see. Because I had no authority in Jesus' name. You use it in two different situations. When we're tempted and when we're ministering. In other words, when the, you know 1 Corinthians 10:13, uh, when there is no temptation taken you, you know that verse, but I will give you a way of escape. The way of escape is resisting. It's Satan that's tempting you. And so when that temptation comes so strong, some of us have used the other weapon of prayer and prayed and still fallen while we were praying. And friends, I hadn't got victory over my worrying yet. My impure thoughts, those rotten thoughts from the past that I just couldn't get out of my mind. Oh, I always confess it as sin. As God forgive me. Confessing the same sins over and over again is, is a miserable Christianity. And worrying and fear. And I said, God, how can you give me such victory when I'm so weak as a Christian and I haven't got victory in my own life? But friends, I found out that the name of Jesus is good in both situations. That when the temptation came so strong, I could say, Satan, I resist you. I'm not listening to you anymore. I'm listening to Jesus Christ. For instance, he says, worry, you know, or fear. You're here, they're going to get your head this time. And Jesus says, fear not, be anxious for nothing. And I say, Satan, I'm listening to Jesus from now on. Listen to you long enough. And friends, 
So I, I didn't have victory yet, but yet the power of Jesus' name helped me through. Then I was at that big church, and one day, I don't know, something happened, and, and I hadn't had time to resist Satan, and I'd gone to that church, and all the noise in that place, and unreal, and all of a sudden, I remembered, I said, oh, no. How can I resist Satan in front of all these people? What if it doesn't work? Now, it had worked every time, but I'm a doubter, I guess. And I, the chief was at the door. I walked out of that church. I said, chief, don't let anybody out. I'll be right back. He thought I was going to the water hole or to go to the bathroom. I went into the jungle, and I, I said, Satan, I'm sorry, but I forgot something this morning. And you know what it is. I resist you in Jesus' name. No, you, I command no activity under that roof. This place is dedicated to God, and there's to be no interference with the communication, no activity, and, and I command you this in Jesus' name, withdraw, and I have authority. Now I found out how much scripture I had to quote. I got through about the first half of the first verse, and the noise in the church died down. I thought, wow, that taught, taught me something. And I walked back in that church, and the chief was still at the door, and I walked in, and they all looked at me and said, Tuan, what happened? Well, there was a change of spirit in control. And I preached the gospel and many were saved. And from then on, friends, in all those villages, people turned to Christ. And after so many years of nothing and so wanting to quit, the power of Jesus' name so strong and gave us that victory. And friends, Satan hinders us. Have you ever gone to prayer and or you've missed times of prayer and you finally one day you made it on your knees by your bed and you were so happy that here I am, I finally got the chance, I finally made it to prayer and then you thought of the things you had forgotten to do and all of a sudden you realize that deadline or that letter or whatever and you got up and Satan still won. Oh, I had to take a notepad and put it beside my Bible and I put on there the heading, the things Satan will remind me that I need to do. And I made a list. And I say, Satan, thank you for reminding me. I'll take care of that as soon as I finish praying to God. Yeah. And friends, that did it. And, I, and that gave me victory, so I, at least I could pray. So I forget my notepad. And the sorry thing is that six months later, I fall in the same trap again and forget about it. And all of a sudden, I realize I'm supposed to have listened to, learned that lesson and... I get my notepad back. Hey, we need to remind it. Have you ever had a problem in the morning and you couldn't get to sleep and you gave it to God and you say, God, here, and I don't know what to do, and then you're almost asleep, and all of a sudden that problem, you say, oh, no, what am I going to do in the morning? And you run through. It seems like Satan says, go through the whole thing one more time and you'll get the answer to it. And you worry about it, and then you realize that maybe you better pray some more, you know, after all. Paul prayed three times for his thorn in the flesh. I should pray it. So you get back on the floor on your knees and you give the whole problem to God. He gave it more detail. God, this is the way it is in case he didn't hear you the first time, right? And so, and so you give it to God and you, then you say, God, give me a good night's sleep. Why do we say that? Because we've been there before. And then we get almost asleep. What happens? You warriors. You, where are you? Huh? <laughs> almost asleep and the thing hits you again. Oh, and you're back out there again. That's when he says, you've got to pray at least three times, you know. Oh, man. You go through it. Then finally you do fall asleep from exhaustion, but you wake up in the middle of the night and you look at your clock. It's worse now these days when you have these big flashing numbers, you know, that's shining. You see, oh, man, only three hours. And well, you don't sleep anymore the rest of the night because he's got, he's got you twice now worrying about the thing and he's taking away your sleep. And all you needed to do was say, Satan... I resist you in Jesus' name. I've given that problem to God. If you have any problem with it, go talk to him about it while I'm sleeping. He's in control. He's got the problem. I resist you in Jesus' name. He says, be anxious for nothing and quote your authority. And oh, friends, we had it with my wife. She was so wonderfully healed one time in a jungle. She was sick, and, you know, we don't have handy telephones and doctors like you do, and we have to get on our knees to get healing, to get, you know, our problems. It was quite a bit cheaper there. Um, <laughs> and my wife was sick, and so we prayed one night, and she was gloriously healed, and we praised God. And the next morning she says, Otto, I hate to tell you this, the pain is here in the same spot as it was before. I must have been, I, I'm not healed. And, you know, Satan comes in and says, see, God doesn't do this in, in our day, and doubt sows doubt in our minds. And 
I said, but Carol, you were healed. We rejoiced and thank God last night the pain was gone. She says, yeah, I thought it was. It must have been all in my head. I'm not healed. And then we thought of it and we resisted Satan. said, Satan, if you've got anything to do with this, we command you to leave my wife alone and withdraw. And you know what it was? As soon as we commanded this, the pain left. It was a counterfeit pain in the same spot. How subtle Satan is. We wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities and powers. And he'll, he'll try to discourage us or defeat us, but counterfeit is one of his master tools. He de- he's a deceiver, and his main weapons are deception and, and temptation. And friends, we are more than conquerors through him. Oh, there's many other illustrations I could give, but I think we should close now. Let's all bow our hearts in prayer and just surrender to God. Oh, Heavenly Father, most of us have surrendered everything to you. We've let you be Lord of our lives. We've responded. And so you, Holy Spirit, have taken control. But now, oh God, we realize how, how we become targets more than ever before. And Satan, that master deceiver, how he causes us to worry and causes us to get angry, and how we forget truth that we've learned. So remind us, O oh God, every day. And, O oh God, I pray that now we you might help us, that all of us might be totally surrendered and, and filled with your Holy Spirit so that we might be able to resist Satan. For we know that if we're not spirit-filled Christians, Satan will laugh at us because he, he's still in control of areas of our lives. So God, help us to be diligent, to surrender to you, to be filled so that we have that authority to rebuke him, to resist him when necessary, and to see him flee from you. And I pray, God even now, that everyone here and all those that might see this video might might have the joy of experiencing Satan flee from them and experience a victory over their own temptations and in the area of witnessing and spiritual warfare ministry, that, Father, we might have joy in the victory which you've won for us at Calvary. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.